Hi everybody and welcome to um, our salon. Welcome newcomers. I can see a lot of newcomers um, this time and I can see some familiar faces as well in the room. So welcome to this, our, our Salonistas as well. I am Marty, the founder and director of the salon and it's really great to see you all here. Please make sure that you have something to drink, that you are relaxed and comfortable and please enjoy the evening ahead. Some practicalities to um, start with. Holly's there in the background helping um, with the salon. So hi Holly, she, she's, she's in there in the background helping us out. So some practicalities, um, salon info and news to start with. Your microphones are muted just so we can concentrate and focus on Leslie and Fiona's salon, but it would be lovely to see your faces. So feel free to put your cameras on so that we can see that you are, are there. Um, and please wait till the end of the conversation to write in the chat as Holly will provide any links that may be of interest. And there will be an opportunity to make comments and ask questions at the end. The salon is also recorded and it will be put on YouTube, our YouTube site um, afterwards. So if you if, um, please turn your cameras off if you wish not to be identifiable. So the salon, um, for those of you who, who are newcomers um, this evening, is a compassionate initiative whose purpose is to provide a home and community around new and established authors and poets whose work relates to compassion and well-being. It is a place, and it has become a place actually, for people to connect, inspire and support using books and poems to consider various aspects of human existence in an extremely challenging world. You can find um, more details um, about the Compassion Salon on our website, and you can sign up to our newsletter, and also on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you like our event, right space we can alert you to to future events so our next salon is with jill cox and kate diggory both of whom are here hello hello and they're going to be discussing um jill's brilliant book thank you jill and for your little heart moments of meaning living life whilst facing death and the tickets for this will be available from the start of april all our books um, and of, of, of our authors at the Salon can be purchased from our um, Compassion Salon Bookshop, which is hosted by bookshop.org, um, which supports local bookshops. And all our authors' books are here and any recommendations we make of compassionate and, and well-being um, books, which there are many. It's also marvellous um, as we get 10% of all books and we really want to keep the Salon free inclusive for everyone so Holly will put that link in the in the chat we're also supported by Lighthouse Books in Edinburgh Lighthouse Books is a woman-led independent community bookshop and um, that win lots of awards and they stock most of our sal salon books and indeed have a compassion salon corner which is quite marvellous and occasionally we'll have some um, special signed ones in fact I must ask Leslie to sign my copy but we'll we'll provide links to all that Alongside acknowledging the support of Lighthouse Books, I would like to thank the Royal Society of Arts because they give us our virtual online home Zoom um, and they collaborate with us on, on joint salons in the year. And also the University of Edinburgh Chaplaincy, in particular, Reverend Dr. Harriet Harris. Hello, Harriet, for um, their continued sponsorship and support. So to, 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 to tonight's salon with Dr. Leslie Morrison and Dr. Fiona Filippi in conversation. Self-care and self-compassion, we know, are vital to staying healthy and um, fulfilled. But what I really want to know tonight is how, in the, in the midst of all this stress, we, we make time for our own um, self-compassion. So in this salon, Leslie and Fiona are going to explore more compassionate ways of thinking about healthcare for both professionals and their patients. And, you know, going to be looking at the benefits of holistic healthcare, which Leslie views as an interaction of physical, mental and environmental and spiritual well-being. So Dr. Leslie Morrison, Leslie is a retired GP who has always been committed to holistic health care and believes in the power of the arts and humanities to affect health. She is a trustee of MedAct and believes that health professionals' role in planetary health, One Health, can also contribute to their own well-being. She is co-editor of Tools of the Trade, which is here. The little book of poetry gifted to all Scottish medical graduates and designed to offer support and nature and nurture creativity. And Leslie is the author of the book that we will be discussing tonight, The Wellbeing Toolkit for Doctors. I've no idea if you can see these books or not. 
And Dr. Fiona Filippi, Fiona is the Acting Head of Research and Development and Head of Doctoral Education at the Institute for Academic Development at the University of Edinburgh. Her work is underpinned by a strong belief in creating frameworks to enable researchers to take ownership of their development and to look after themselves and others. She has a PhD in politics from UCL, has worked in several countries and in public and private higher education. So, each salon begins with a poem of the author's choice. The poem tonight is Clearing by Mar Martha Postlethwaite. And I would like to invite Reverend Dr. Harris, the chaplain of Edinburgh University and friend and support of the salon to read Leslie's poem, but also to pro provide a moment of reflection on our fellow humans suffering in Ukraine and around the world. Harriet. Thanks so much, Marty, um, and and thank you to thank you, Leslie, for choosing this poem and and um, inviting a moment for Ukraine. So we're going to take a moment, which I will close with the poem, uh, to think of those in Ukraine, those who are fleeing, those who are receiving um, refugees, and all who have people in the region and who are afraid. And as we think of them, we um, we also wish to extend to them hope um, and love and fortitude and faith for the future. Clearing by Martha Pusselthwaite. Do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is your life falls into your own cupped hands and you recognize and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to this world so worthy of rescue. Thank you, Harriet. And so handing over to Leslie and Fiona to begin our salon. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, obviously, to start with. Um, oh, I see I'm spotlighted now. That's, <laughs> that's great. Um, yeah, well, thank you very much um, for suggesting that, that I speak to you about, about your book, The Wellbeing Toolkit for Doctors. And I'm, I'm not a healthcare professional. I've never worked in healthcare. Um, but I, I think it's a great book. I think um, it's, it's got so much use for, for everyone, actually. And um, reading through it, I was struck by a lot of the things that, that we do as well um, for say, new PhD students and things like this. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of things that, that I was struck by. Um, but yeah, I, I just wondered if I could start by asking you, how it came about. Okay, thanks. And, and thank you everybody for coming. It's lovely to see people here. Looking forward to a conversation with other people afterwards. Um, I, I was a GP. Um, which I consider myself very privileged to have been. I think it's, a, it's an amazing job. Um, you spend your working life listening to people's stories, having amazing conversations being presented with challenges and, 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 um, and questions and problems and trying to help people solve them. Um, and you realize, I realized while I was working that I was hearing things from individual patients that possibly nobody else had. 
you know, they may have shared it with a loved one, but they may not have. And that felt incre incredibly um, humbling, really. So I, what I started doing was I had my black book, which sat on the shelf above my uh, surgery table, my consulting table. Um, and if there was a little vignette or somebody said something or there was a little incident that I thought was really interesting, I try, I, I tried to capture it. I wrote it down. Um, and that was just for me to kind of in, think about it and reflect and enjoy it and, and, and often learn from it. Um, so I also had had this, this idea that I would like to try and put some of these stories together. Um, when I was in practice, I looked after the medical Edinburgh University medical students who came to the practice. Um, and I loved having students. I loved you know, talking with them and, and, and finding ways to engage them in what being a GP was about. Um, and so um, I had this idea that it might be useful to kind of try and compile some of these little vignettes into a, a book. Um, I, one of my colleagues was very, was interested in the arts and humanities and the use of poetry in the arts and healthcare. And we talked a bit about trying to um, uh, create a little book of poems, which might be useful for, for, for doctors um, or healthcare professionals, really. Um, uh, Pat died suddenly and I thought, you know what, this is my opportunity, I'm going to stop talking about this, thinking about it and actually do it. I approached the Scottish Poetry Library um, with the idea and they were amazing. They said yes, immediately, it was just fabulous. And from that came this little book, um, Tools of the Trade, which as, as um, Marty said, has now been gifted to all Scottish medical graduates since 2014. We're just about to bring out the fourth edition. Um, and all the poems are short and accessible, but in some ways speak to the experience of being a junior doctor. So um, that's you know, been well received. Um, but and some of the feedback was, yes, that was really, you know, I appreciate it, but actually I don't really do poems, you know, have you thought of writing something in story form? And so that was really the impetus to, um, uh, to write the book. And one of the things that does does strike you when you're reading the book is is these um, little vignettes, as, as you've referred to them, um, sort of little stories about, mm -hmm. and are, are many of the ones in the book from from your stories? Most of them, most, yeah, most of them I think are, but they're obviously completely um, anonymized, you know, or, or they're often composites of various people. And I was super careful, of course, um, to be very, you know, to be, to be clear that this, nobody could identify themselves. And I'm absolutely confident that that's the case. Um, and similarly, talking with colleagues uh, or, or, or describing situations with colleagues, you know, I had to be very careful that everything I said was absolutely accurate and also that it couldn't be misinterpreted or it couldn't in any way be offensive to anybody. Um, so I, I haven't heard from anybody that it, anything was offensive. So, so maybe that's okay. But I think I think they're really important in giving you, and they're very they're very accessible. They mean that it's mm -hmm. it's it's, it's um, very easy to relate to them, and to actually having if you're on the receiving end of healthcare, you kind of you can kind of get a get a sense of of, of maybe the the challenges in a way for for um, being a doctor. Um, yeah, and. I mean, I suppose one of the other things that struck me was that it's it's a toolkit. So I, I suppose the the advantage of having a toolkit is that different people will find different things, mm -hmm. um, and different people will find different things useful at different times. And I wondered, in in your own experience, did you find some of these tools particularly more useful than others? Yeah, uh, yes, I think that's absolutely true. I think um, I think so, some of the, 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 the so-called tools, each chapter is a tool. The, the chapters are short. Each chapter is a tool. And the sort of thing is humor, honesty, compassion, self-compassion, teamwork, psychological support, um, uh, and language, communication. So um, 
I, I, when I was used to talk to medical students, I would talk about the C words of general practice, which is, you know, communication, cooperation, collaboration, caring. Um, and so those are those qualities, I think, those things that really make healthcare special and relevant and useful, I think, are a thread through, I think, not just health professionals, anybody who's offering care or support, you know, those qualities are the things. I think that make a difference between just you know run of the mill providing a service and actually helping people and 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 making people feel special and making people feel that you you know genuinely interested in them. Um, so I think those sorts of things are probably pretty consistent. Um, uh, the humour is one of the chapters, and I think I think that is important because I think you have to like as in a relationship you have to have a sort of trusting relationship with somebody to be able to laugh with them. You know, if you can laugh with somebody, I think it's an incredibly bonding thing. And there's a quote at the beginning of that chapter, um, which says, you know, laughter is the closest distance between two people. And, um, and I think that's true. So, um, uh, you know, but it talks about how to use humour appropriately, you know, or, and what I should say is the book is no way didactic. I'm not in any way trying to say this is the way to do things. Uh, the, the real, I suppose the key message of it is look after yourself and stay in tune with your own instinct about who you are, how you can be a doctor. And, you know, every single doctor is different. Every single person is different. Every single doctor is different. And every single doctor will work in a slightly different way. And what matters, I think, is that they are being honest a to themselves in how they're practicing and being and honest to the patient and to their colleagues. And so I think honesty is, you know, a really integral part, well, as we know of all relationships, but I think in this kind of therapeutic or the professional healthcare relationship, I think it's just essential. And it can sometimes be quite difficult to be honest, but I think, on, and sometimes you have to ration the honesty a bit, but I think honesty is absolutely fundamental. And so, yes, that's a true. And I think some of the tools you you have to keep polishing. <laughs> you know, it's um you have to like any you know a work a workman uh, who has a work person who has a, a toolbox. You know, they, they you have to look after the tools. You have to keep them polished. You have to keep them in good condition. And I think that's the case as well with some of these tools um, that you know you need to constantly think about them and uh, assess them and learn more and you know and be curious about how they're working um, and different situations as you say Fiona will require different tools. Yeah my, it, it's something else that I, I kind of was thinking when I was um, reading it there was how so having these tools at, can you learn these tools in a way so I mean there's that sort of balance between you you, you you know you tell somebody to do this at the beginning of of their career but then they can't actually learn some of these things until they've until they've experienced it mm. in a mm. way and, and I suppose related to that was um there was a bit about um how you can put sort of compassionate education into a very busy medical curriculum as well and as it's kind of related to that so is it you know and I, I know you do work on that and it would it would be great to hear a bit more about that actually but um yeah so is it a kind of add-on or do you think it's something that you can kind of weave in throughout yeah no I think compassion I mean I know you know we're incredibly fortunate in Edinburgh to have the global you know base of the global compassion initiative and the work that Harriet does in the, in the chaplaincy looking at compassion and the value of compassion and you know there's lots now being written about compassion and some of the salons previously have been around compassion and um, it is it's just a it, you know it, it, I find it really interesting that you would imagine that compassion would, would always have been an integral part and a very important part of healthcare sadly I think there have been times, and I think when I trained, which was, you know, about a million years ago, or maybe the early 1970s, um, and Andrew, hello, I can see you're in the audience, one of my classmates from Aberdeen University, um, uh, it was, 
you know, there wasn't a lot of attention paid to that. You know, it was slightly mushy. It was, you know, you were there to learn your facts, to learn your anatomy, to do this at the next day. And uh, you, there was a, a, a little bit of communication skills. And if you were very lucky, you were working with somebody who was a good role model and you learned by it was mentoring and you learned by example. But you could quite easily go through and not really be encouraged to think about what kindness and compassion was. And fortunately, I think that really is changing. And, and that is that is being introduced. And I think the other thing is in healthcare that as in so many other aspects of, of, of you know sort of service provision, if you like, um, the things things get attention and resource if they can be measured. So in the dreaded GP contract, which thankfully has been abandoned and we've moved on from it. But, you know, when I was working, you, a practice was rewarded if they had measured the blood pressure on, you know, each patient once every two years and recorded and blah, blah, blah. So the things, and of course, blood pressure is important, but the things that got disproportionate amounts of attention and reward financially and otherwise, were things that could be measured. And as we all know, the, the really important things in life, you know, compassion, love, kindness, generosity, can't be measured. And so, you know, it's we have to find a way of attaching value to them in a way which people who are responsible for resources and are doing their very best to spend public money best in the health service and social care that they somehow take that on board and I think one of the myths that is you know gradually being busted is that compassion and efficiency are opposites and in fact they're not in fact they are sisters you know they're one and the same if you if you for instance if you're conducting um a rather unpleasant procedure on somebody even if it's just taking blood and you uh, I do it in a kindly way where you acknowledge that somebody might be frightened and how they're feeling, they are much more likely to allow it to happen and for it to be successful rather than to have to say, sorry, it didn't work that time, come back next week. So, you know, compassion and efficiency, actually, I think in, in many, many, many instances go hand in hand. And, and I think that's a really important message for, well, for students, and people working in healthcare, and also for managers and for people who are responsible for, you know, allocating budgets and giving enough time to people in consultations or, you know, during procedures. Yeah, yeah um, it's it, one of the things that is kind of right through the book as well is the, the particularly difficult circumstances of, of the pandemic and, and people mm. working in the pandemic mm. and, and now um, and there's a few things that you say about the the kind of impact that you see that having had such as for example the the kind of flattening of the hierarchy mm. in healthcare and I wondered mm. if you could say a bit more about that because I think that's an interesting yeah I was I was really lucky and um, I was really indebted actually to Liz Grant, the Professor of Global Health at Edinburgh, who put me in contact with people uh, working through COVID um, in all sorts of places throughout the world. Uh, and it was very common, and, and, and also, I, you know, through contacts locally in very, very busy hospitals, UCL and Centre of London hospitals in Glasgow. Um, and it was a theme that came up, which was that one of the, you know, when there was real urgency, when things had to get done, when the pressure was really on, um, a lot of protocols went out the window, a lot of minutiae that people usually had to spend a lot of time paying attention to went out of the window. And people just did what they could as quickly and as well as they could and so all the kind of traditional high not all but some of the traditional hierarchies that have existed and have you know really impeded progress and good quality care got looked at again and people i mean the value of teamwork was of course immense what i should say actually is that i when i um took this book to a publisher that looked pre-COVID. So I was wanting to write it anyway. And it just happened that when I started to write it, COVID happened. So then it became particularly, I think, relevant because obviously doctors and health professionals were under you know extreme stress. Um, 
but that sense of you know everybody being in it together and people relating to one another as human beings and not as consultants healthcare assistants cleaners you know whatever you know that people took their labels off and and still assumed their their appropriate responsibility for the skill level they had but were much more members of our team trying to cope as best they can and one of the chapters in the book is actually about teamwork and the value of of, um, of teamwork yeah i think the but i think you know i think for this generation of um, young people and obviously the people i'm thinking about particularly is our you know, medical students young doctors it is such a tough time you know you know there's nobody here who doesn't you know, uh, you know, kind of understand what I'm talking about. You know, they've had, there's been the climate crisis, which has made people, you know, an existential threat, which has made people really question their futures and the future of the planet. And then there was COVID, which of course, in some ways is very connected with the climate crisis in terms of the etiology and effect. And, uh, um, and now, of course, there's conflict and war, and which there always has been, you know, but you know it hasn't been so close to home for a long time, and um, so I think you know those three things—the climate, COVID, and con they, they're other seas in a way, but much less pleasant seas. And they're the ones, and you know, having to navigate um, your own well-being and juggling um, professional demands, which especially for junior doctors are you know really intense. Professional demands, social demands, you know, having families or friends and maintaining looking after elderly relatives, whatever those, those social demands are. And then a sense of how do I engage with these wider issues? You know, and I think as doctors, you know, we have a particular voice, you know, we understand the effects of those major threats on health, individual health family health, community health, and, and, you know, we understand the physical, the mental, the psychological, and the spiritual um, aspects of health and how they can be affected. And I think that comes back to what you were saying at the beginning, Fiona, about sort of holistic health care. Um, and somehow, I think, um, you know, I think everybody and is trying, and especially, you know, and, and young doctors aren't exempt from it in some ways, you know, it can be even more intense for them, um, are trying to figure out how, how do I keep a balance? You know, how do I respond to all these demands? How do I engage in a way that's useful, not just with individual patients, but in wider issues of health, you know, causes of ill health, social and health inequalities? How is How can I engage with that in a way which a at the same time as doing all these other things in a way where I maintain my balance and my well-being because as we all know you know if, if we're not feeling well and balanced we're not going to be able to be as much good as we would want to be to other people um, so I think this this idea of, of you know the role of health professionals for you know, for your patient, for the family, for the community, and then what's now being, being increasingly called planetary health or one health, you know, it, it, they all interlink. And obviously, when, if somebody comes in for, you know, their precious 10 minute consultation to discuss, you know, their dying husband or whatever, you are not going to hijack that consultation and start talking to them about climate change. But there are opportunities, you know, when you're changing somebody's inhaler prescription, it is completely appropriate to say, do you realize if I change this inhaler, it's better for you and it's not producing so many gases that are going to damage them. So there are opportunities. And I think it's increasingly, they are being incorporated, that sort of wide angle lens, I kind of refer to it in the book as, um, is being used and, and I think, um, healthcare professionals are being encouraged to ne never never to the detriment of the individual person that's sitting in front of them that they're trying to help but to give a perspective and often that individual person sitting in front of them i mean you know take a refugee for instance you know embodied in that one person 
are so many of the issues that we all and politicians and everybody are grappling with. You know, climate change or war causing mass migration, causing dislocation, causing people to lose their homes, causing people to become refugees. So working, especially working in inner cities, but you know, generally, um, that one person sitting in front of you, my, their story might actually be a global story, but you know, manifest in, in that one life. And you know, to be able to hear those stories and talk to people is just, you know, is such a, a privilege. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's one thing that, it's a difficult thing as well. I mean, all of these pressures that are put on people is actually in some ways the kind of another pressure to kind of, you know, find your right tools to, to make sure that you are looking after yourself and things. It's, it's this um, kind of, I'm reminded of a couple of years ago when um, I could be able to do inductions for new researchers and things. And, and it got to such a point that I was actually watching a, a series of um, presentations and thought, actually, we're, we're telling these people who are just starting on this, that, that they're going to, you know, find it very, very difficult. They may, you know, go into sort of crisis at some point. They're going to do this. And actually, I thought we, we probably need to move a little bit away from that. That's not, it's not necessarily the right audience at that point. And so it's that, it's that sort of, is it, is it another, another thing to, for people to have to deal with? Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, t I absolutely totally agree. And it's the same. I mean, there's been quite a lot written in the press recently, hasn't there, since Ukraine, about how do you talk to people, about how do you talk to your children about the war? You know, young people are, you know, on social media a lot, they're picking up a lot of very, you know, over -dra dramatic and re repeated, you know, um, uh, you know, stuff, doom scrolling, I think is the, is the word people are using. And, how do you talk to young people in a way which is um, useful for them? And in a way, I think the same thing applies. You have to be honest, you know, you have to acknowledge their feelings and say, yes, no, I understand you're it's scary, I understand you're scared. A lot of us are scared. And you, then I think you have to try and find a way to say, and this is, and we can do something, and there is, and there is some hope. And I think for me, that's the key thing is this, there's, um, I mean, a lot of people in the, in the, in the, in the salon will um, know about the work of Joanna Macy, um, but, um, you know, that, and, and, the, and the, a fabulous book, which I think should just be on the reading list of every university course, which is Active Hope. Um, how do you uh, acknowledge somebody's sadness? And in some cases, despair, and channel that into action, into some, even if it's very small, piece of action which gives them hope. And um, so, I think the other aspect of what you're saying, actually, I, I've been thinking about this a lot, is, um, you know, I, you know, telling people about, uh, or you know, acknowledging to, in your case, you know, new students that. Um, you know, they, they may have problems that there's places to come, you know, if they, to talk if they need to. Um, ab absolutely, what you don't want to do is give the impression that they will, will automatically have issues or that they will automatically need help or that they will automatically. And again, for me, I think a useful starting point there um, is to say that everybody needs help. You know, everybody benefits from support. Everybody at some point in their life would benefit from some form of counselling or therapy. You know, and the difference is some people have the, the skills, the vocabulary, the ability to ask for it, you know. Um, so that acknowledging that you're struggling doesn't become a self, it doesn't become a self-fulfilling prophecy that that you know, but um giving people somehow giving people the message that it's you know, it's okay to find things tough. And also that everybody is different. And I think that's the other thing, isn't it? When you're designing courses and designing programs of well-being, I imagine it's very hard 
to, you know, one size does not fit all. And it's very hard to provide something that would be relevant for everybody. Um, so, I mean, I think it is, you know, responding to that one individual, one individual person's need is, is, um, is difficult. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and acknowledging that. And the other thing that, that that strikes me a bit is that, again, if you're you're telling somebody to to look after themselves in so many ways, you're putting a lot of onus on them. Whereas sometimes it's the it's the structure or it's the culture in which they're working in yeah. that actually is is the problem in a way. Yeah. And yeah. and so, yeah. How, yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think I think sometimes one of the most useful things to do in that situation is to give people agency or to 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 um to try and make a change. And I, you know, to, again talking about junior doctors, that could be finding ways of going to the consultant or the manager or whoever to say, um, you know, my experience is that this isn't working or I have information which might be useful to you that such and such you know. and so I think um you know finding ways to give empower people because a lot of the time in big systems as we all know um you know people can very easily feel like a tiny cog in a very huge machine and that is not a comfortable feeling um so empowering people to feel that you know they have some degree of agency and the other thing i think in systems is you know and everybody here has probably had experience of you know going to a doctor presenting at a hospital and every individual person they meet is doing their best but the system's not working um, and it can be incredibly hard to um to change that but in my mind, the parallel, you know, we can easily sit in our cars if we're forced to use them and complain about the traffic. And then you think, hold on, excuse me, I am the traffic. You know, every person sitting in every car is the traffic. And I think in a sense, it's the same. When we are part of a system, how, how, what, what can we do? And it might just be a tiny thing. It might just be making a suggestion about rewording of a letter from outpatients, you know, tiny thing. But actually, you know, the ripple effect, as we all know, can be extraordinary. You know, throwing a stone and a ripple, you know, can make, uh, turn into a bit of a wave. So it's, um, and I think the other thing also is, 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 is the, is the is the teamwork thing you know finding that there are probably other people who are having similar experiences having similar difficulties and would like to make the same change yeah i think i it's one of the other things as well is and i i'm i'm sure this is a it must be a huge worry for for doctors and particularly junior doctors and things is um how do you maintain this when you make mistakes which I think you say in the book that, that it's, well, I mean, in life, it's inevitable, but obviously as a, as a doctor making a mistake can be, can, can have a huge impact on, on people. Um, mm. How do you, you get back from that or how do you deal with that? Yeah, I think, I think the absolutely honest answer is that sometimes you don't, you know, I think, very sadly, I think sometimes doctors make mistakes and they live with them forever. And that's, you know, horrible. Um, but I think, again, I think the culture of the health service is changing, where it's, you know, the notion, instead of mistakes being something that was wrong, mistakes are something to learn from. Um, you know, and we all know about what we call significant event analysis, you know, looking at specific things that have gone wrong and trying to learn from it. But I think a culture that, that encourages people to see that, um, you know, mistakes are something to learn from. Um, so, you know, you obviously, you know, you do your best and, and you, you, you do the, um, the training that's required and you keep yourself updated and you do the reflection and you do your absolute best and you will make mistakes. And there is nobody who 
doesn't and and um and I think again getting back to honesty I think being able to be honest with with patients about things that have not gone as well as they might have done or when you have made a mistake is um is really important you know and and I think patients really value that and it can it can actually turn out to be a really important building block in a relationship if you're able to say look I'm really sorry I should have done X Y Z and da, da, da. Um, and they can that can actually it, it turn out to be a really uh, positive positive thing. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah something that struck me. I wonder. I just saw Holly's message, which <laughs> always on Zoom. You kind of sort of start. Um, I yeah. One of the other things that really came through, and it's it's something that I think a lot of people don't probably think about when they think about medicine is creativity and mm -hmm. I know that you have a, have a great belief in arts and humanities and, 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 and how that links up with with medicine as well and I just I, I was interested just to think about what what does creativity mean to you in in being a doctor and, and how do you think it can 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 help well, I think in I think in various ways. One is, you know, a lot of medicine, a lot of life is about problem solving and having creative solutions, just a bit lateral thinking, you know, finding ways of casting a different light on a situation and a problem can, you know, is is developing that skill that you apply to life in general. But I think, you know, if, we, if we're talking about healthcare medicine, it's also really valuable in medicine. And um uh, and using, as you say, the arts and humanities, poetry, and music to kind of enhance people's understanding of what it's like to be in a certain situation of, of poor health or approaching dying or whatever it is, you know, using other lenses, if you like, to look at the situation through um, can, can help to provide solutions. Um, but also, I think keeping your creativity alive, alive is incredibly important for your own well-being. Um, you know, and th that was the aim of, as I said, of Tools of the Trade, this little book of poems, was to nurture creativity, you know, and, and to get away from this notion. You often hear people say, I'm not artistic or, you know, I'm not musical. And you think, you know, do you enjoy singing in the bar? Do you ever do a little drawing for your child? You know, we've all got seeds mm -hmm. and I think we've been, I think a lot of us have been thinking a lot recently in the last few days about seeds you know planting seeds in various ways from which you know positive things can grow and um and I think those seeds of creativity doesn't need to be major but just watering <laughs> watering there are a lot of analogies between uh well-being and garden you know just look after the tiny little seedling keep it watered, watch what kind of light it likes to be in, move it into that light. The dead stuff, cut it away, you don't need it. And nothing's wasted, you know, you and cut out. Yeah, and yeah. literally you have, you have um, one of your tools is actually green therapy. <laughs> therapy, <laughs> green therapy, <laughs> exactly. Green, not just in terms of, you know, we all feel better if we're outdoors and there's all the evidence that if people are in, in recovery from operation, the recovery time is shorter if we can see green space. And there's now good solid scientific evidence for that. But actually, you know, green therapy for ourselves as well, you know, getting it. And I think as, you know, when we've all been really distressed about Ukraine over the last few weeks, um, you know, the one thing, if you're, if we've been able to get outside and breathe in fresh air and look at nature, um, you know, we all know the benefit of that. So I think the, the um, you know, and there are, there's some, there's, there's, um, there's a very good book called The Nature Cure, written by a horticulturist who also work, who works in mental health. And um, she looks at all these parallels. You know, um, we have bad experiences, we make mistakes. It goes in the compost heap, nothing's wasted. You know, from that comes new learning, new soil, new fertilizing. You know, so I think, um, I think just in, obviously we need within healthcare and a lot of jobs we need to have protocols there need to be you know certain 
uh, standards and certain things, boxes you have to take in certain situations, but to give the flexibility to uh, to make use of and express your creativity, I think it's really important. And I think a lot of junior doctors are feeling that it, it's very difficult if that's squashed out of them, you know. And I think I, I personally think that a lot of healthcare now has become so protocolized that people are, have be, are being trained not to have faith in their instinct, you know. That if if a, if a person has X Y Z symptom, you do Z. You know, and and um, and and the set the notion that you are the person who has a relationship with this particular person, this patient, and that you have a sense of what's right and what they want, and that you develop trust in your own instinct. I think there's a, a lot of, of of doctors are, and I think it applies to nurses and other people as well, um, are feeling that that's being a bit squashed. Mm -hmm. You know, they would like to have a bit more autonomy. They would like to be able to be more professional. They would like to use their judgment more. That certain, for reasons of safety, certain protocols are helpful. And if you're learning how to treat diabetes, for instance, it's very helpful to a very clear protocol. But actually, for the really important sensitive times, like and end of life care is a really good example. I think just being able to keep in touch with your instincts and your gut feeling and trusting that for how you manage this situation or help this person is really important. And that's where I think creativity comes in, just being, being um, aware of and respecting that your own creative thought processes will be, uh, are valid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like that, yes. It's, I, I think it's, it's something that really, that, that really struck me and it, it's not something that I, I think I'd thought about having it, you know, mm. how it's uh, related to, to medicine before. Yeah. Um, I, are we moving on to the session? I, I, hi, hi, yeah, hi, <laughs> hi, yeah. Um, Hi, Leslie. Thank you. I just want to say thank you so very much for, for that conversation. I really enjoyed it. And it's so relevant to the teaching I do to medical students. And I, I will ask a question in a minute, but I, I just wanted to say something about creativity. And you were talking about singing and, and things. I, I, I read um, Dick Van Dyke's latest book recently, and he's got a whole playlist of songs to dance to, to cheer you up. So I always feel like I should share that because it's really quite marvellous. <laughs> so, that's Dick Van Dyke. I'm not sure we'll get him to the salon, but just he calls it, um, I think, ad hoc dancing in your house. So I quite like that. But can I just quickly ask, and, and thank you again, Fiona and Leslie, can I just quickly ask, as you know, that I teach, um, medical students at the university it's self-compassion and well-being and many of our students are young and starting off in their lives some of them 17 18 and sometimes when I talk to them a lot about well-being they will say oh I mean I can think they're saying this in their heads here's Marty again talking about well-being and it's it's not important it's not relevant to me it's all about bubbly baths it doesn't make any difference and sometimes I do engage them, but sometimes it's quite difficult to engage them with, with those sorts of conversations, which I know will actually help them later on in their careers very much. But how, I'd like to know, Leslie, how you give me some hints and tips about engaging the students in discussion of their own well being and self compassion. Because, of course, they're ordered to do that by their professional bodies, you know, health professionals to look, you know, have self care and to be able to monitor and be able to know when they need to seek support. So, I think, did that sound like a question? I think it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I think. I think that kind of touches a bit on what Fiona and I were talking about, about earlier. It, it, there is, there can be quite a fine line between offering, acknowledge, you know, acknowledging to the person sitting in front of you that they, at some point in their life or their professional life, will need support. Acknowledging that and not sounding as though you're predicting that that is inevitably what's going to happen. You know, and I, th I think it can be really, really hard. And I think for me, one of the things is just to um, to try and make it clear that it, you know it is not exceptional to need support 
you know, being human, you know, means that we need to relate to other people. We need to be part of families. We need to be part of groups. And that we, um, you know, we, we will inevitably at some point need help. Uh, but, but that it's, and that's a, being able to acknowledge that's a positive thing. You know, it's not a, it's not um, something to be ashamed of. But I, I, I can imagine the scenario you're describing, um, and again, I think it come, One of the things it might relate to is that it's very different having that sort of conversation one to one, as as opposed to to a group. And sometimes just constraints of time mean you are talking to a group. Um, because uh, no two people are exactly the same. No two people, um, uh, you know, feel feel the same. I'll give you an example. It's in. The, uh, it's interesting actually. It's, I, I've mentioned it in the book. I had. Um, I did. Um, I do some teaching with with uh, first year medical students. And a couple of years ago, I had a group, and there was when they, we started. I went around and said, "What you know? Uh, tell me a little bit about yourselves." And there was a one young guy, and he said. I love to play the violin. And, uh, okay, that's great. And then it became clear in the subsequent weeks that he was really not, re not really engaged. He wasn't taking part. He wasn't participating in the group. He wasn't contributing. Um, and so I managed to find an excuse to have a conversation with him afterwards and said, you know, when you're sitting there in this group, are you really wishing that you were playing the violin? And he said, yeah. And it transpired that his parents were both doctors and there was been a lot of pressure to do medicine. And he really wasn't at all sure that's what he wanted to do. Um, but interestingly, after and we had a bit more of a conversation and then in some, by pretty well the following week, he, he was more engaged because, you know, where he was at had just been acknowledged, you know, and it wasn't a, it wasn't a problem. It was just an acknowledgement that of where he was and why he was finding it to engage, you know, so, and I couldn't have done that in a group and it wouldn't have been something, you know, so I think, I think for me, it's about finding time to have the one to one conversations. Thank you, Leslie. That's, it that's occurred really to me, helpful. Marty, that Leslie's yeah. book is actually, um, Leslie's tools would be a really good starting point. Yes, engaged. <laughs> I should have been listening more closely. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Fiona. Thank you. Um, Robert, um, I know wants to ask a question and I've unmuted him so he can he can speak to us. Hi, Robert. Of course. Thank you. Um, I'd like to hear an example of when the toolkit particularly helps you, Leslie. You've been scribbling away for years, taking examples, and you've amassed them into this toolkit. I'd particularly like an example of when perhaps you had to ration honesty, what factors were at play, and how the toolkit or what you were learning helped you get through or resolve the situation. It doesn't need to be about rationing honesty. It's an example of how the toolkit worked for you. Right. Um, okay, I don't, I'm not sure if, if this is exactly what you're meaning, Robert, but um, I had a colleague who I've, we had a slightly difficult relationship. He, um, he, found the fact he was very stressed for various reasons and he found the fact that I was um apparently enjoying my job <laughs> and was enjoying my job difficult it seemed to accentuate his feeling of stress and I um I struggled with with it and that was I wanted to talk about that in 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 the book um about how to you know, communicate, how you communicate in, in challenging relationships. Um, and I thought long and hard about whether I could, and in fact, in the end, I did. And in the process of writing it out, and I think this is what we often find, so called therapeutic writing, in the process of writing about it, I gradually realized that I was 
understanding where he was coming from in a way which I really hadn't previously. You know, by just trying to write it out and, and, and describe how I felt and to try and um, imagine how he felt, I, I came to a realization of why he had found me difficult. Um, and so I, and I suppose that what, what I, I suppose that's, that's the process of writing it for me was really helpful. Um, and I suppose the only thing is I wish I'd done that. Yeah. I mean, I've always through my career, I've always tried to write out and if something distresses me, I'll try and write it out as a way of processing it, a way of kind of self-therapy, if you like. But um, it was by trying to write this out, hopefully for the benefit of other people, I realised that it was helpful for me. And I did slightly think, I wish I completely understood that, you know, 15 years ago. So it, it, it helped you, but later, I mean, there's nothing against that, but it, it's just if you'd been earlier or had the benefit of the full toolkit, then you could have resolved the issue sooner. Um, yes, but I think it's at a distance, it's often easier to resolve these things because mm. when you're in a work environment, you know, there's, there's repercussions. Mm. And there's not time, and dan, 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 dan. So if you can carve out, it's a bit like we were talking about with Marty, you know, the carving out one particular instance, one particular relationship, it, that's easier to deal with. But in the real world, you know, when you've got a busy practice or a busy office, or you know, it can be really hard just to focus on that one thing. But I think that is the trick often, is just to, um, to try and carve, you know, peel away all the other things and really focus down. Great, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for your question, Robert. I think I can see Harriet's wee hand up there. Can I? <laughs> yes. Thanks very much. Um, thank you, uh, Leslie and Fiona for the conversation and, and Marty for your question at the end. I think what, I, what I'd like to, I'd like to join that conversation, if you like, about how you talk to people at the point where they're starting out, where most of what you say to them goes over the top of their heads or, you know, and then particularly around compassion, they might have a lot of, you know, various reasons for not wanting to engage with that. They might, part of it might be bravado, part of it might be, um, you know, that they're, be, they're, they're still being very top slice intellectual using that bit of their body and nothing else. and. And, uh, and part of it might be that they just don't relate to it. But I think, you know, with well-being, it's, it's, um, it's always more effective to, do, to show by, by doing rather than telling. Mm. And, you know, we can fall into um, a way of telling people about well-being, which is the same as telling people how their essays are going to be assessed and where to find... Um, you know the office and you know it's all just it's all just information but and then it won't sink in but well-being and compassion need to be experienced mm. and that's when that's when people get the point mm. and so you know I think with students starting out yeah they don't know what it's you know but for example medical students don't know what it's like going to be like on the on, on the wards and you know any new student doesn't know what it's like to have the pressure of a university exam but they do know what it's like to be themselves at that moment. Mm -hmm. So the way you can do the well-being is do something that speaks to easing things for them at that moment. Mm -hmm. And that's probably going to be, it's, it, it can feel difficult coming new into something, can't it? You know, how mm -hmm. loud is your inner critic shouting at the moment? Who's feeling a bit of imposter syndrome? And I bet you at least 99% of the hands will go up. Mm -hmm. And then speak to that piece, speak to the bit that's sore at that moment, or don't speak, I mean, do it, do something, <laughs> do something and, mm. you know, do, do and, and make the environment an environment of well-being, not a clinic, not a, I don't mean clinical in the medical, but, you know, if it's just the same old lecture hall um, feel mm. and well-being is just another thing you're talking about, it's going to have exactly the same effect as everything else you're talking about, you know. Yeah. It's not going to be a felt lived experienced effect. And 
I really like the point you made, yeah. Leslie, about um, you know doctors things being so. Um, I think you were saying so policy, or so protocol orientated that it puts us out of touch with our intuition mm. or our instinct. And I think one one of the one of the fantastic things about compassion, because it, it precisely because it's embodied and precisely because it's to do with the gut actually. So you use the phrase gut instinct and compassion is is really it's it it's it's the gut is where you feel it yeah. you know and the, the the king james version of the bible talks about the bowels of compassion you know, there's there so many ref, you know so many citations throughout the authorized version of the bible it's always the bowels that, it moves my bowels of compassion because you do you know when you're really moved by something it's a tug right in that very core part of you isn't it yes right in the in the gut and so with as we grow compassion we actually really grow a confidence in our own reaction to things mm. you know that starts to become a compass for us it starts to become what one of the things that navigates us and and mm. i think we increasingly start to trust our responses and our intuition yeah 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 no no i completely and i i, I totally agree harriet that it's not you, you know you don't i don't know you, 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 you wouldn't want to, to teach well-being in the same way as you would teach CPR technique, you know. Um, you know, it's something that should just be integral to all aspects of teaching. It should absolutely, that ideally, that attitude of compassion, self-compassion, compassion for others, should be integral to all teaching, you know. And, and, and I think I've got a, a friend who's... A, who was a GP in a very busy practice in in, um, in Hackney, actually in East London, and she she was a brilliant GP, and but she was quite dismissive of the GP teaching program, where you have you know student, um, trainee doctors coming in and teaching them the trainer taught the trainee, for two main reasons. One was that she was learning as much from the so-called trainee as she, she was teaching him or her, and the other one was that you can't teach somebody else to, how to be a doctor. They know who they are and they know how they want to be a doctor. And, and what you can do is be an, provide an example of one kind of doctor, which they can then observe and decide if they think that works or it doesn't work. Blah, 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 you know? So I think the whole thing about teaching as or sharing skills being in a sort of gentler way almost just saying just off offering an example you know this is how i do it see if it works for you see you know and and as i say that it's integral that the, the, that kind of notion of compassion and self-compassion are just integral they're not separated out they're not taught from three to four on a tuesday you know there it's in, i'm sorry marty i hope i'm not saying anything that sounds a bit rude to you because i know you teach well-being but but you know i think I, I think ideally it should just be integral to, to you know to the whole curriculum there was when you were saying about um, compassion in the gut harriet i think several people here have seen it but there was most fabulous program on bbc4 uh, a couple of weeks ago and it's still on youtube and it was a talk between desmond tutu and the dalai lama both of uh, whom obviously have had incredibly difficult lives and both of whom have expressed compassion throughout their lives and the talk was their co it was a conversation and they were sitting and they were teasing one another and it was a very human conversation and a lot of laughing and they Desmond Tutu actually said compassion is hardwired in human beings and you think mm, Putin really you know so it gives you food for thought but the other thing they were talking about was um, compassion and joyfulness, you know, and how you can express joy and how you can um, identify joy and find joy and be and feel comfortable with being joyful. And I think that's actually really important in healthcare. You know, to if you can laugh and be joyful and find humor, as I was kind of mentioning a bit before. In really difficult situations, it's it can be an incredibly bonding thing, you know, because it's from a basis of real trust. And I think to be able to share moments like that of really laughing, really, also really crying, you know, but just being 
honest, you know, having these real, it, it can be so valuable and, you know, just an you know, extraordinary experience. So anyway, I recommend, it's, as I say, it's available on YouTube and it was one of the most uplifting things that I've watched over the last two or three weeks. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks for your questions, Harry, and the discussion. And I want to say, uh, Leslie, if only we could <laughs> be in a position that we had completely integrated well-being and, and compassion into our curricula. That is our very <laughs> purpose: is to to, to 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 make somehow to make that happen. But small steps, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, sorry, sorry, Marty. That just reminds me of something. Do you mind if I just butt in quickly? Yeah. Um, I, I, quite a lot of the book, as, as, as Fiona said, is it talks about um, the climate crisis and, and doctors' role in the climate crisis. And my kind of view of that is that not just for doctors, but for everybody, you know, citizens, local councillors, politics, everybody, that we need to be seeing any decision that any of us make, whether it's in our personal lifestyles, um, policy decisions that councils make, whatever, through the lens of, of climate. You know, everything connects to it and we need to be making all our decisions, uh, having looked at things with climate crisis lenses in our glasses. Um, and I think it's a bit parallel with compassion. You know, it's it's just everything, you know, it we, we almost need sort of compassion meters <laughs> built into our lenses. You know, it's a it's a similar, um, it's just a, a, a kind of view maybe of the world or of our lives. And I know that that sounds rather easy to esoteric, but, but I, I, I um, and it's a huge shift, but um, I, think, I think we're getting there. Uh, thanks, Leslie. I just wanted to come back. We have got a lot of questions. because I was thinking when you were saying about Putin being hardwired for compassion, um, certainly scholars like Paul Gilbert would say that we have two sides where, I mean, this is very a visual, but not actual representation, but we have two sides, a compassionate side and a competitive materialistic um, side. And there's a story, and I think Harriet might need to keep me right about this, but there's two wolves and the grandfather was talking about to a child about these two wolves and said, you've got this one side that's compassionate, this one side that's competitive. And um, you need to really focus on the, the compassionate side. And the child said to the grandfather, well, what do I do? And he says, well, don't feed the competitive side, just feed the compassionate side. And I think that you know, is quite an important message in, yes, we are hardwired, but some, in some societies we've forgotten how to, how to, to use that. So mm. and how to, to use our... Um, compassion okay so Kim has a question and um, I'd like to hear more examples if possible on where measured outcomes complement a compassionate approach particularly in relation to health inequalities thank you Kim that is a tough but good question did you get that Leslie yes yes and I I mean it, that's a huge question and I think the the whole thing about health and social inequalities is, I mean, that was, it, I, I think actually one of the silver linings of the very dark COVID cloud that people became aware of the extent to which health and social inequalities affect access to healthcare and healthcare outcomes. Um, uh, the other aspect of health inequalities that is, is very topical is the, the last IPCC, International Planet and Climate Change, report, which is not cheerful reading, well, it's very, it's about 8,000 pages, so I don't think anybody's going to read the whole thing, but the essence of it is that, you know, um, where we are just now is the, 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 the quote they use is an atlas of human suffering. But for the first time, if, I think this is the third or fourth IPCC report, and the first time they're talking about inequalities, and, and making it very clear that those, the poorest and the most vulnerable are suffering and will suffer most in climate change. So I think, you know, inequalities are, people have woken up to the effects of health and social inequalities the other, on healthcare. And the other thing, of course, is racial inequalities and the extent to which racism exists in our society, exists sadly in healthcare, 
Um, there's been quite a few reports recently demonstrating that, and that's really shameful, but sadly true. Um, so I think, you know, uh, but I think, I think the fact that um, through these, and again, it's a thing sometimes through really tough situations and new learning emerges. And I think through COVID, through the climate crisis, and actually even in Ukraine, when you look at the people who are managing to escape from Ukraine, there was a convoy of cars got out of Mariupol yesterday, which is fantastic, but you know, only certain people have cars. You know, so it doesn't matter what situation you're in, those health and social and economic inequalities pertain. Um, and I think, you know, that whole thing about looking at health as an expression of social justice and climate justice, looking at health as an expression of justice and injustice in our society, which is kind of the politics of health, you know, that people aren't unwell, ran, you know, don't get extremely unwell or have extremely bad diabetes or extremely high heart disease randomly. It's because they are in, um, you know, or often, but not obviously exclusively, but often because they've got up in the living in poverty, they've got very poor opportunities, they're unemployed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I think, um, that's been recognized by people working in public health, people in, you know, working in general practice, particularly people also working in healthcare, social care for a long time. But it's really, I think, being taken on board now by politicians and by people who are making budgetary and uh, resource decisions. And, and that's good. And I'm not sure if that answered the question. Did that answer the question? I think so. <laughs> Thank you so much, Leslie. Thank you. Um, I've got a really good question here, actually, from Jill. Um, and thank you. In fact, has Kim written back to us here? Yes, thanks, Kim said. <laughs> thanks. Um, I've got a good question here that I've now lost from Jill. I found it again. From Jill, any who's our, our next author, actually, next in, in um, April. Um, any hit, hints on how to remain yourself and authentic when faced with a busy schedule and challenging situations in medical environments? <laughs> well, um, the, the, the technique that I sort of developed and adopted, and what I'm, I meant to say actually before was that in no way um, am I saying that this all this book is, is me offering some ideas that were useful for me. And in no way am I saying, you know, you know how these awful books that everybody got, how to bring up a baby and how to breastfeed and how to the sun. <laughs> in no way am I saying that this is a how-to book. All it is, is a collection of, you know, sort of stories and my experiences. Um, and I hope obviously that some of them might be useful to other people. But Jill, the, the thing that I found most useful was I was at, I actually worked um, at a distance of about 30 miles from where I lived, which in some ways was useful because it gave me a sort of, a, a, a sort of debrief, a sort of self debrief time, decompression time between finishing work and getting home. In some ways wasn't good because I couldn't engage with the local community to the extent that I would like to have done. So it was pros and cons. But I had a morning routine, which was that I would claim the day. You know, I knew that you know by the end of the day I would be swept in all kinds of directions. I couldn't predict how the day was going to pan out. I would just have to go with the flow a lot of the time, and it would be a bit of an emotional roller coaster as well. And I, I, I think it was important to acknowledge that I couldn't control it. I could do my best to control individual appointment times which brackets I was very poor at, um, I could do my best to be at meetings and time, I could do all that. But actually, the really important stuff, the relating to patients and disease, would be a roller coaster and was, I couldn't control. And that's, in a, to, in a sense, the way I wanted it to be. So what was really important for me at the beginning of each day was to claim the day, was to make my, the day my own. So my routine was rain, hail, snow, shine, sit in the garden for 10 minutes, have my very probably on PC cup of coffee, meditate, do a little stretch routine and then meditate for 10 minutes. 
um, which meant getting up very early, but it was worth it. And then on the way to work, I had one particular spot, which was by the river. Um, I had a very nice commute along the retreat. Um, stop by the, the most particular spot and just sit for five minutes looking at the river. And then I drove to work. And for me, I then arrived at work feeling, you know, gratitude maybe, it's a bit of an overused word sometimes, but a real sense of gratitude for having this day um, and feeling that I had made the day my own, you know, and that I had appreciated and enjoyed it and anything that happened afterwards was just going to happen, you know. So, um, yeah, that was, I found that useful. Thank you, Leslie, for that. I just want to say that I felt all relaxed when you were telling that story as well, <laughs> walking along the riverbank. And absolutely, it's finding that space, isn't it, for, you, for yourself? But just, re I mean, it's interesting, though, just relating that back to the previous um, question about health and social inequalities, you know, not everybody has got that privilege. You know, if you're a junior doctor living in a, in a small flat in London, in a tower block, because that's all you can afford, and you're, you know, you start the day having to drive along some horrible, busy road, and then, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it was very easy for me to do that. It isn't, it wouldn't be easy for that person. But I also think that it's not pie in the sky to think that, that you know, even somebody in that sort of situation can carve out uh, 10 minutes you know, even if it's sitting in their bedroom before they start, you know, saying, okay, no, I'm grounded, I'm ready. Thanks so much, Leslie. Um, we've got one more question, but I'm not sure, I don't know if Michael would like to, to, to speak or not. It's up to you, Michael, if, if, you, if you want to ask your question. Would you like, no, nope, <laughs> that's fine. Um, can you see that there, Leslie, in the chat? Isn't the main message to medical students and doctors is that if one practice compassion for oneself and all that entails, one will also be able to give compassion and good care to their patients as well. The converse is true. So the converse being that if you look after other people well, you look after yourself well. Yeah, and I wonder if it's the converse is true that if you don't look after yourself well, you also can't look after other people as well. You know, <laughs> the, the oxygen mass sort of analogy i think it, it's that if michael wants to write in a bit more um that would be great but yes i think it is that yeah no i i mean i i i, I totally agree i think if if you are feeling you know stressed and um not very happy in your skin for whatever reason then the chance of you being able to really listen really be open to what your patients or people are saying to you are are much reduced um and you know sometimes it's it's inevitable i mean i'm you know it's you wouldn't be human if you didn't have days where you felt a bit grumpy or you know you you just are you know not not focused and not as present as you want to be I mean, if, if, if there weren't data like that, you wouldn't be human. But um, I think, yes, it's undoubtedly true that if you're not feeling cared for, either by yourself or by other people, you know, by your loved ones, by if you're in a situation where you haven't got connection with other people close by, you don't have family, you don't have loved ones, you don't have people you trust. And that sadly happens to a lot of junior doctors, you know, who shifted around the country at a great rate of knots. They're often dislocated from their family and friends, they're separated from, even from partners and husbands and wives. I mean, you know, it's a very inhumane system in lots of ways, and it's very hard. I mean, I think the analogy that, um, you know, a lot of people use is, is, a, is a tank, you know, and if, if, the, if, the, if, the, if, if the tank is empty, if the tap's been left on and the tank, your tank of self-compassion is empty, um, it's very hard to find a reserve to, you know, to give to anybody else. Um, so, yes, I mean, I think that that is what Michael said is absolutely true. Thanks. Thanks, Leslie. And I hope that helped. 
Michael. I like these analogies of tanks. My one is the battery, about keeping a, you, your battery fully charged and not letting it, you know, drain out completely because when things are tough and you're running on empty, everything is much more difficult. So that's my, my mine is the battery one. So thank you. Thank you so very much, Leslie. Thank you, Ursula has been putting a few things in the chat for us. Thank you so very much. And um, I think that's the end of the questions, unless anyone has anything else they wish to ask. I just want to say thank Wait, you so much. Oh, yes. I Sorry, I am being very rude. I'm butting in. But if just, could I, would you mind if I, and it kind of links into to that last thing I was saying, could I just read out the last couple of paragraphs because the quote that I think I'd really like to share with people. Is that okay? Absolutely. Just Absolutely, go for it. Okay. So this is this is actually the, the very last page of the book and it's um talk the chapter talks about your personal well-being toolkit, saying that you know everybody's toolkit will be slightly different. You know, we'll have different hammers, screwdriver, you know, everybody's toolkit is going to be slightly different. Um, uh, take care of your tools, maintain them and redesign them as required. Carry them with you. Encourage others to acquire the ones that work best. Look after yourself. Let others look after you and enjoy your work. And here's one last two. Breath. Breath has many forms. A breath of wind, a deep breath, a breath of fresh air. Remember to breathe. Even when things are really tough, breathe. When you're about to embark on something very challenging, a procedure, a presentation, an interview, breathe. In, out, in, out. You're alive and that's a good starting point. In one of my meditations during lockdown, sitting beside a beautiful old tree, I imagine myself breathing with it, providing carbon dioxide, receiving oxygen and feeling connected to the natural world. And this is the quote I'd really like to share. No matter how unrealistic it sometimes seems, we need to believe, as Arundhati Roy says, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Thank you so much, Leslie. And that's a perfect place to, to end. Thank you so much to you. And thank you so much to Fiona. It was a wonderful, wonderful salon this evening. Thank you. Um, to Harriet, everyone that's here that is new, all our existing um, salonistas. And thank you, Holly, very much. Please check in the chat because there's a number of people chatting away. And thank you to all of those who are saying thank you. Um, and we'll hopefully see you at our next salon on the 20th of April. Thank you so much, everyone. It's a real privilege to spend the evening with you all. Thank you. <laughs>